Hey everybody, welcome back. It's time for Witchcraft Fundamentals Lesson 6, Spellcasting Fundamentals. That's right, what you've all been waiting for, how to actually cast spells. Uh, we'll get there, I promise. Uh, so spellcrafting. This is the number one place where my one-on-one -on -one students start to freak out. <laughs> uh, because that's actually casting spells, actually performing magic with the intention of manifesting some kind of change in the world can be incredibly intimidating. Uh, <laughs> the movies have taught us that this process is fraught with peril. You're going to monkey's paw yourself into some terrible, terrible fate. If you act like a dumbass, you will get dumbass results in magic. If you actually do things mindfully, logically, in the correct processes, spellcrafting can be perfectly safe. It all depends on your intentions and how well you can focus those intentions. Uh, so the very, very basics. You know, we spent the last two lessons talking about correspondence and components. And it's all building up to this moment where we actually put that together into actual magical practices. Uh, there are some fundamental kind of laws of magic uh, that you'll find on the internet and in different books. Um, Isaac Bonowitz's Real Magic has a whole section on it. Um, there are no real laws of magic, but there are some things with very high correlation <laughs> um, and really good guidelines. One of the most basic kind of fundamental understandings of magic is the idea of the law of sympathy. And the idea is, you know, as we spent the last two lessons talking about, everything in the world has an energy, a flavor, a unique resonance. And that energy will attract similar energy. That's like attracts like. That is something you're going to see all over the internet, all over books. That is the law of sympathetic magic. And almost all folk magic, low, low magic, natural magics are based on that idea. Kind of partnered to that is the idea of contagion. That is the idea that if something has an energy and you bring something else next to it, the energy from one will affect the energy of the other. It's, if you, <laughs> it's a great episode of Mythbusters where they're trying to get a bridge to vibrate with people like marching to the same frequency the bridge vibrates at. That's kind of the idea with contagion. If you have a resonance, you can, and it's strong enough and similar enough to other things, it can shift other things to match that energy. And that's really what spell work is all about. We have our intentions and we want the energetic vibration of that intention to go affect things in the real world to change those things to match our intentions. That's what magic is all about. Um, well, that's what low magic is all about. High magic is a whole different thing. And that's not what this program is about. Low magic is all about taking your intention, sending it out into the world to manifest change in accordance to that intention. I like to think of spells as rocket ships. Um, when I was a kid, you know, in elementary school, we had rocket day every year and we made those Estes model rockets. They look like the Marvin the Martian spaceship. Um, but you know, it's a rocket. It's got a fuselage, it's got a motor, it's got a payload, it's got, you know, all these different components. And you can think of your spell like that. The rocket ship itself is the spellcrafting method you choose. And we're going to talk all about spellcrafting methods in a little bit. The trajectory at which you launch that rocket is your intention. The payload is the energetic kind of body that is going to hit your target and then begin to manifest your will. That's the rocket ship of your spell. Um, Maybe that visual doesn't work for you. I fully invite you to think about it differently, but that's how I think of them. Um, so there's lots and lots of different ways of doing spell work. Um, 
the thing that you must remember, and there is a terrible, terrible tendency in our community to talk about magical thinking rather than actual magic. Way back in lesson one, I talked for a while about why magic does not equal magical thinking. I'll give you this super short DL, oh, you know, if you, uh, the TLDR, if you haven't watched that video, why are you watching this one first? Go back, go back, watch the earlier videos. They're all the foundation for making all this stuff make sense. Um, but if you have skipped, magical thinking is, I want a thing, therefore it shall manifest for me. Magic is, I will do everything I possibly can to get my will and then also add magical energies to it. Magic and spell work is a support to mundane actions. If you want to do a spell to get a new job, you need to enchant your resume, enchant your lucky shoes when you do your interview, do a spell to help you find the right jobs to apply to. You cannot do a spell for a new job and expect someone to stop you at Starbucks and say, you, you over there, you shall now be my data analyst. That's not how reality works. Spell work is a support for the mundane, not a substitute for it. End soapbox rant. Um, so once you've done all the things that you can in the mundane world to get what you want, then you look to magic. And the first thing you need to do is understand your own intentions. The number one way for your spell work to go awry is for you to not actually understand what you really want. You know, <laughs> part of my mundane training is I'm a mediator. In mediation, we have the concept of a position versus an underlying interest. And this is something that you can think about when you're trying to formulate your spells. Your position is, I want to go out with that particular human. I like them. I want them to fall in love with me. That's your position. Your underlying interest that that position you think is going to fulfill is that you want a meaningful and uh, joyful romantic relationship. You're lonely. You need companionship. Those are the actual needs you're trying to satisfy, not necessarily the, I want that, that specific human. Because you don't actually necessarily know what you're going to get with that specific human. Magic is like that. You can do magic for very specific things. But that leads us to that kind of monkey's paw story. Um, if you don't know the monkey's paw story, it's a lot of be careful what you wish for. You just might get it. Feel free to Google it. I think there's a Twilight Zone about it. Um, <laughs> but to get the most out of your spell work, to actually have your spell work work for you, to manifest what you truly desire, to actually make your life better, I highly recommend doing your spell work to satisfy your underlying needs, not the specific thing you think is going to fulfill those needs. So instead of saying, I want that specific human to fall in love with me, you might do a love spell that is, help me to find the partner that is best for me. Help me to find companionship in a way that will heal my heart and assuage my loneliness, you know. Do spell work to ask for what you truly need, not what you think you want, and you're going to get much, much better results. Um, so when you think about your intentions for spell work, you need to know what you want, why you want it, how you want to get it. That's a real important one. You know, going back to that monkey's paw twilight zone thing, uh, if you do a spell for great riches, the next thing that might happen is someone knocks on your door and a beloved relative has just died very tragically and left you their estate. That's probably not what you actually wanted to have happen, unless you're a terrible person, in which case, why are you watching this? Um, hopefully you're not a terrible person. You don't want other people to be harmed, you know, in service of your desires. 
Um, there are whole other branches of magic where they do that kind of thing. That's just not what I do here. Um, I invite you to Google it. They're out there. You also want to think about how your spell work might affect others. Now, depending on who you are and what you're asking for, you know, this is different levels of thoughtfulness. Your morality is your own. Um, but if you do a spell to get a particular job, you know, maybe you'll get it and someone else who was maybe better for the position, maybe needed it more, might, well, they won't get that job. Balancing our needs versus the needs of others is a very specific moral choice. And I, I encourage you to explore the potential side effects of your magic so that you can decide for yourself whether there are consequences you think you can live with. Because you're going to have to. And then you want to think about any other ethical concerns the spell raises. Uh, you know, there's a... <laughs> Every tradition has their kind of rules about what kind of magic you are and are not allowed to do. And it very, very much depends on the culture it comes from, uh, the lineages and, you know, religions and spiritualities. Um, I personally have the kind of ethic that if I am willing to live with the consequences of my actions, then I can take those actions because that's the reality that doing magic actually has. Um, and if I'm not willing to take responsibility for the consequences of a spell, I don't do it. It is as simple as that. You know, there are certain um, traditions where, you know, they have that kind of that harm and none caveat. Um, I don't subscribe to that because I think it's very, very limiting. Because what does harm mean? You know, it's that, you know, if you get the job, someone else doesn't. Well, that harms them, but that doesn't necessarily mean I'm not going to do the spell to get my dream job. Um, there's a lot of, like, Wicca specifically has a um, prohibition against caging spells. Uh, caging spells are spells that impede the free will of others. So the, you know, stereotypical is going to be your love spell, you know, to make that specific human fall in love with me or be obsessed with me. Um, they don't like that kind of infringement on other people's free will. I try not to do those kinds of spells, but there's a time and place for anything. We'll talk about binding a couple lessons. Um, but, you know, you're an adult. You have your own ethos and morality. You're allowed to make those decisions for yourself. I just recommend that you actually take the time to really think about it and decide if things are actually what you want what you're actually willing to have happen to get what you want and then what living with the consequences will feel like for you. Make your own choices about that. Once you've kind of thought about what you really want, what you really need, what you're genuinely trying to accomplish, your ultimate goals, you know, and you can do this by asking yourself, oh, I want this. Why do you want it? Okay, because of blah, 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 blah. Okay, why do you want those things? Oh, because they do blah, 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 blah. And why do you want those? And keep asking yourself why until you get to that kind of the bottom of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs where it's like food, safety, shelter, um, you know, companionship, that kind of stuff. Get all the way down to those very, very basic needs. And that will really help you understand what you're genuinely trying to do. Once you've gotten there, write down a statement of intent. Now, as you kind of progress in your studies, you're probably not going to be writing big formal statements of intent for every little spell you do. I certainly don't. But when you're a beginner in particular, and if you're doing something large later on, physically write out I, or type, you know, whatever, um, an actual written statement of your intention. What that will do is help you to really understand what you're asking for and you can be specific i want x y and z because i want you know because blah 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 here are the boundaries i'm willing to have that happen within um, one of the really common ways of doing this is you know if you're a religious person you might say you know if it be the will of you know my patron deity or the will of nature or you know, whatever 
whatever you serve, be it the will of that, then my spell shall go forth. Um, you know, one of the really common ones, you know, by, by the goddess's will and harm to none, let this my spell not be undone. Sounds very pretty. Um, I think it's just a sign of poor planning. If you think your spell might harm somebody and you're not comfortable with that, do a divination. Hey, is this a good idea? Oh, it's maybe not a good idea. What things about this do I need to change to actually get the results I want? That's what divination is for. Helping you understand things that are not easy to understand. When in doubt, do some divination. So you write down your statement of intent. You need to be specific enough to get what you actually want and avoid unintended consequences as much as possible. But you don't want to be so specific that you don't leave room for the things you haven't thought of. You know, we might want a specific type of job, but the universe might know that we're going to be way happier with something else. You know, that's part of the, instead of asking for a specific job, you're going to ask for a job that lets me pay my bills and not stress about money and, you know, come home and feel fulfilled and ask for your underlying needs rather than a specific thing because you just don't know what your best option is always going to be. Um, <laughs> it's a very delicate balancing act to actually be specific enough to get what you want, avoid unintended consequences, but leave room for opportunities you have not foreseen. It takes practice, and that is the only answer to it. This is why I really recommend, as you're starting out, do small spells. You don't need to do the, you know, major working to find the true career for you, or, you know, lead me to my soulmate, giant rituals. Start with... Help me to continue to get to work on time. Help me to have a strength in the immune system as I go to this public event. Help me to, you know, find the recipe that will best nourish me for dinner tomorrow. It, not every spell needs to be the end of the world, capital N, fundamental need. It can just be, oh man, I'm running late. I want all the lights to be green as much as possible. It is safe for traffic. Start small. Start small, because if you mess it up, and you will, the consequence is only going to be equally small. The more energy you put into workings, the bigger they are, the more kind of monumental the changes you're trying to accomplish, the more impactful unintended consequences can be. So start small until you're more comfortable with what you're doing. Once you've got your statement of intent, you need your power source. This is another area where there's all matter of controversy. Energy is energy. Everything has energy. It's kind of like the force in Star Wars. Everything has energy. And we draw on that energy to fuel our magic. You know, everyone will start off with their own kind of personal energy field. You know, we talked about auras in that earlier lesson. Your personal energy is something that fuels your magic. Um, if you're not someone who feels energy very easily, super easy thing you can do is literally take your hands, rub them together, and then feel the energy between the palms of your hands because it flows from one hand to the other. Um, and it's a great way to just kind of start feeling energy. Now, your personal power is a limited resource. We have the amount of energy we do to run our bodies. You know, we require a certain amount of energy to digest food, to move around, to keep breathing and <laughs> metabolizing and doing all the things and thinking. If we spend a bunch of energy doing magic, well, that, that drains our batteries, essentially. And we're going to need to eat something, maybe take a nap. We don't want to just drain all of our personal life force, essentially, doing magic. 
that's not sustainable. You know, it'll, in life or death kind of situation, you do whatever you've got to do. But part of the main skill set of being a practitioner is learning how to draw energy from other things. That's what all those correspondence is about. The energy of the stones, the energy of the herbs, the vibration of the color, the energy of, you know, the chi, of the oils, of foods, of flowers, of all these things. We are drawing upon those energies. We're also drawing upon the energy of our environments. Uh, you know, this is my office. This is my giant ass altar. This is where I do magic. This room and I have a relationship, <laughs> energetically speaking. This is my space. Um, and I take care of it, and it takes care of me. One of the biggest mistakes practitioners make is they'll draw on a bunch of energy to do a ritual, you know, drumming, singing, dancing, you know, meditating, all these things. They'll draw all this energy up and send it out into the world and they don't replace it. That's a problem. Anytime you draw energy out of a place, you need to put energy back into the place. This is not as difficult as it sounds. Um, it's the whole idea of making offerings. If you're going to draw energy from a place, you're going to give back by maybe lighting a candle, maybe putting out some flowers, making some kind of offering. You know, um, I very commonly will give offerings of corn masa because um, it's relevant to a lot of my practices. Um, and, you know, alcohol is really, really common one. Um, some traditions will be like, you have to give them rum or whiskey or wine. It's very, very common. Some places it's just, you know, pouring out some water. Um, but if you're going to draw energy up, you need to put it back. Here, this is my home. So I give my energy back by taking care of my home, by cleaning it, by maintaining it, by, you know, putting happy energy into the space to replace whatever I'm drawing in my magic. It can be very, very simple. Um, you know, it's just take care of your space and it will take care of you. Um, if you have, you know, I'm very fortunate. I have a yard, I've got, you know, about a third of an acre. So I have lots of plants and trees and things on my property that I have relationships with. And we have kind of a deal me and my land where it will nourish me magically and take care of me and guard me but in in response to that i have to not garden with pesticides i have to be responsive to when the nature spirits have requests of me uh, usually cleaning up energy where something negative has happened i have to do certain things in exchange for being taken care of that's a balanced and healthy relationship with my space. I highly recommend you do the same. Um, once you have power sources, and this can also be um, if you have spiritual allies, people that work with deities, ancestors, fae, sometimes they can actually supply the energy for your working. Um, and that's a, just a whole different thing. We'll talk about metaphysical entities in a few lessons down the road. So once you have your power, however you're going to use it, whatever it's come from, you have to be able to manipulate it to a certain extent. You know, we have lots of different energy centers in our bodies. You know, the, the third eye, palms, the back of the neck, the base of the spine, the soles of the feet. These are places where energy kind of concentrates and flows in a particular way that a lot of people can feel it, like physically. I, like, I can physically feel my energies. I can tell I'm a little tired today. Um, but once you have your intention and you draw up some energy, you have to then tune that energy. And that's usually done by concentrating on your intention. Um, oftentimes it will be speaking your statement of intent aloud, you know, as I gather this energy forth, I tune it to the purpose of creating perfect health and maintaining the strength of my immune system. Uh, 
you know, as I will it, so might it be. And then, yeah. Doesn't have to be some giant, giant thing. It can be very, very simple. And if you're doing a candle spell, you gather your energy and you put it into the candle. And then you light the candle to do your spell. So if you are not someone that feels energy intuitively, one, practice. You might be able to develop that as a skill. I was certainly not born with it. Um, the more you kind of try to assess energy in yourself, in places, in others, the easier it will be for you. Um, but if you're not someone that can sense energy, because there are people that just naturally, the way they perceive things is not, it's not physical. That's fine. Um, I highly recommend playing with your senses and energy. You know, for some people, there's almost a synesthesia thing where it's like a smell. Um, maybe it's doing particular movements or actions. Maybe it's singing, you know, whatever makes you feel energetic and powerful, that's the way you should do it. Um, for me, it's very verbal, very physical, because that's what works for me. What works for me might not work for you. There's a million ways of getting there. Um, you know, if you Google like energy work and energy manipulation, there's plenty of resources out there for you that'll have all kinds of exercise and breathing things that will help you to better understand your own energy and harness energies. It's way more than I can go into into this. Once you have your energy, this is where you might think about tools. Now, I am of the school of thought where tools are bonuses. You know, things like your athame, your sword, your chalice, your altar pattern, uh, wands, candles. All of these things are bonuses. These are things that augment what you're doing, make them stronger. Um, you know, there are some magical methods, particularly like ritual magic, where having very specific layouts on an altar and tools and things, very, very important. And it's part of the magic itself. And if you use a tool over and over again, over time, it develops its own resonance and becomes more than the sum of its parts. But for the most part, you do not need to... Well, you do not need tools to do magic, period, full stop. There are certain types of magic that require tools, and there are certain types of magic that are enhanced by tools. But there's, there is always an option that requires no stuff. As long as you've got you, and you can think, and you can will, you can do some forms of magic. There are other forms that have very specific requirements. I don't generally do those types of magic, so I'm not going to go into it. If you want to learn about ceremonial magic, by all means, Google it. There's a billion resources out there. Um, and they're very specific about how they do things. I'm not. Um, so yeah, tools are optional. If they, if they help you, if they enhance your experience, by all means, use them. If you don't feel you need them, then don't. When I was first learning magic, I was in undergrad. I had a roommate in one room smaller than this one. Um, and while she was not antagonistic to my practice, I could tell she wasn't super comfortable. So I learned how to do all of my magical rituals in my mind's eye, essentially, in my astral temple. And I was literally laying in bed pretending to take a nap. I also was a college student and had zero money. <laughs> so if I couldn't, like, smuggle it out of the dining hall, I didn't have it. Um... Serial divination. Let me tell you about serial divination sometime. Um, <laughs> you use what you've got. Um, the exception to a lot of this stuff is the purely practical. If you're going to do a candle spell, well, you're going to need a candle. And you're going to need some kind of candle holder. And you're going to need something to light it with, either a lighter or a match or whatever. Um, if you're going to burn something, you need a fire safe vessel in which to burn that thing because fire hazards. Um, if you're going to do a sacred bath, you need water 
and a bathing vessel. You know, that might be a bucket. It might be, you know, the shower at the Y. It might be your beautiful claw-footed bathtub. Your circumstances may differ. Um, you need the practical things. You know, when I have my workings, I clear off a space. Actually, it's, I usually use the TV tray that sits next to my desk, um, if I'm being perfectly honest. But if I'm doing like a big formal thing, I'll clear off a space in my altar and do my working at my altar. You know, a lot of my workings are kitchen witchery, and it's literally done at my stovetop. And I use my cooking vessels, because food. Um, I have other things where I have very specific tools for specific tasks. I've got my obsidian mirror. I've got my copalero, which is a big clay vessel for burning copal. Um, and palo santo. I've got a rattle. You know, it depends on what you're trying to do. Um, the main exception to kind of the whatever you got rule is if you are gifted a tool things like you know sacred jewelry um if you get like a mentor gives you an athame or a wand um if you're passed down you know a divination tool from someone who used it for 20 years those things are a little bit more than some of their parts like i said earlier the more you use a magical tool the more it becomes infused with magic the more it realigns its essence to the task you're performing with it you know i have um i have you know a beautiful ebony wand but what i actually use are bow sticks um arnest sticks the martial arts practice sticks this is what i use as a wand um everybody's different but if you use things over time, over and over and over again, they become inherently magical. And that's just a different thing than, you know, something you've picked up at, you know, maybe a Ren Fair. Point. You can get some amazing magically crafted objects at Renaissance fairs and medieval fairs. Highly recommend checking out your local scene for that sort of thing. Um, when you do get a new tool, you do want to consecrate it. Now, depending on the tool, if you've just bought something from a shop, you don't know how long it's been on that shelf, who's touched it, you know, was it sitting in a warehouse, you know, with a bunch of mundane stuff, um, were there labor disputes during the shipping of this magical object? You want to clean off any energetic residue that's going to be on that tool. Easiest way to do is I generally light a candle, light an in some incense, and I will wave the tool through the candle flame, slightly above it so I don't burn myself, and then through the incense smoke. Um, if you can't burn things wherever you are, maybe you're in a, a dorm. I know how that goes. Um, you can actually just hold it and let your own energy go through it and cleanse it. Um, you can asperge it with like salt water I've had stones where I literally bury it in kind of a bowl of salt. All kinds of depends on what you're able to do. Uh, but you just cleanse it so that it has any negative lingering foreign energies can be cleansed off of it. And then you want to tune it to your own working. So I generally will like hold the tool in my hands like this is an oracle deck. Hold it in your hands and you know let your intention flow through it. You know, you are now my deck. I am going to use you for divination. You know, tell me true and blah, blah, blah. You know, whatever you're trying to do with it. And let your own energies, you know, you are my tool now. You're going to work for me. If you do not agree to work with me, please tell me now. I've had tools that I've purchased. You know, I have a beautiful set of bone runes. I don't know if I mentioned before, but... I don't work with the Norse and the runes don't really work for me. Uh, so I cleansed them. I consecrated them. I tried using them and they're like, no, no, we don't really want to work with you. So they went on a shelf. And at some point I'm going to find somebody who works with death energies in the Norse and I will pass this tool on to them. Uh, but for now they're living on a shelf. I don't use them. That's not a bad thing. You know, 
if you get a tool and it doesn't work for you and you can tell, well, you can congratulate yourself for having the energetic awareness to know that it's just not the right tool for you. That's actually a huge step. You can try other things until you find something that does work for you, that does feel right. Don't try to force it. No matter how much you've paid for a tool, it may or may not really be the right tool for you. Or maybe you aren't supposed to use that type of tool at all. Uh, you know, I have a very beautiful carved staff I got once at, a, I think it was like a run fair. Um, and it was gorgeous and expensive and just intricately carved. And it said, nope. Nope, you fell in love with me in the stall, and it seemed great, and got home and was like, nope, I'm just an art object. Don't use me in magic. Um, it happens. It's okay. So, use whatever tools work for you and you have available. Uh, don't stress it too much if you don't have, like, the perfect art object magical tools. It's okay. You don't actually need them. Um, if you're doing a very specific spell that really requires specific things and you don't have them or don't have access to them, try a different way of doing it. We're going from point A to point B. You don't have to take a specific path. If you can't use the specific path you're looking at, find a different path. That brings us to spellcasting methods. Boy howdy, are there a lot of them? Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna put a link down in the description to a handout PDF that I've got. Um, I'm gonna put the Dropbox link up there. That's got a list of a whole bunch of different spell casting methods, a sample spell, and a recommended resource if you like that type of spell. I'll just read through the different methods, but I'm not gonna go super into them because we're already at over half an hour. Um, so the simplest thing is intent alone. That's the, you're literally driving down the highway and you see a car in your rearview mirror that's like going between lanes and you put up the, I, I call them the, the rubber baby buggy bumpers, you know, that my, my travel safety when I'm driving so that I won't get hit by the obviously mentally impaired person that's driving really recklessly. Um, obviously, if you're driving a car, you can't like stop and infuse some candles and crystals and that's not an option for you all you've got is you and your brain so you just have your intention and you send it out to do what it needs to do uh, very very simple literally everyone can do this candle magic candle magic is one of the easiest i believe ways of starting doing magical spells because there is something inherently magical about fire. Now that's not to say that you have to have, you know, great big seven day candles. Most of my actual spell work is done with tea lights that I buy in bags at Fred Meyer with like 200 of them for $10. That's fine. Um, the trick with candle magic and different sources will give you different information on this. If you're burning a candle for a spell, you're going to light that candle and you're going to let it burn down until it naturally goes out. You're not supposed to, like, blow out or snuff a spell candle. There's an exception <laughs> for the great big candles. Um, depending on your tradition, you are allowed to have a candle that you burn in stages for different, you know, maybe you're going to burn it for three hours every day for seven days kind of thing. Um, or maybe you are in it, like, you could end that ismo a lot of time. We have our velas. If you're going to burn the candle for seven days, like, until it burns out, put the candle in your fireplace so it's not a fire hazard. Um, if it's something where you have, like, in the big glass, you have it on your windowsill, maybe move it into your sink to burn overnight. If you don't have cats, um, if you must let something burn and you're not able to intend it, to attend to it, you need to be real sure that you're putting it someplace where it is not a fire hazard. Like I said, the fireplace is the ideal place for this because it's a firebox. Um, barring that, if you cannot safely burn a candle all the way down, 
maybe don't try candle magic. Point A, point B, many ways of getting there. Um, herbal magic. This is where we take our herbs. We do things like making tinctures and poultices and grinding them into incense or just carrying them in a pouch. We're going to talk more about herbal magic in the next lesson. Um, there's all kinds of wonderful things you can do with herbs um, in magic. I do a lot of kitchen witchery. Herbal magic goes into kitchen witchery like a champ. Look at the correspondences for the common herbal ingredients in Italian food. Basil, garlic, rosemary. They're all protection spells um, and prosperity spells. Oils. You can use oils and magic and spells either to anoint yourself, to anoint objects, dressing candles. Um, if you're not familiar with the term dressing a candle, basically if you have a candle, like I'm not going to get up because my headphones have a cord. Uh, but they have those chime candles, the little ones, about four inches tall in thin, various colors. You can usually get them for like 50 cents at most uh, occult shops. Um, they're great. I use them in magic all the time because they come in all the colors. But you take an essential oil or a formula oil and you basically you put it on your finger. I usually put it on my fingertips. You can also use like a Q-tip. Um, and you go from the center out to each end or from the ends to the center, kind of depending if you're sending things out or if you're drawing things in. Not that important which way you do it. Or you can just go from top to bottom or bottom to top, however you want. But that's what dressing a candle is. It's putting the essential oils on it so that as it's burned, it is incorporating the energies of the essential oils. It might also involve like carving things into the candle. Like if I'm using my Ikea tea light, I might put one drop of like dragon's blood oil and I'll use a safety pin and like carve a sigil into it sometimes. We'll talk about that later. Um, lots of things you can do with them. Stones, talked about a little bit in the correspondences. You can do things like just simply carrying them. You can enchant them. You can use them to make amulets. You can use them as altar pieces. We're going to talk more about like making amulets and things in the next lesson. Um, incantations or songs. You can speak poetry. You can, you know, sing. You can, there's a whole amazing, like, uh, in the Finnish uh, mythologies, the Kalevala, uh, Vanamoinen, the wizard, sings reality into being. It's beautiful. Um, <laughs> and as I mentioned, you can do things like sing I'm a Little Teapot to dispel negative energy. Um, every possible thing you can think of. There's all kinds of options there. Uh, cord magic. You can use um, knots to seal energies. Uh, that can get super complicated and it's really cool. Uh, but I highly recommend if you like working with cords and rope and knots, you know who you are, Google the term witch's ladder. Um, the witch's ladder is a specific way of doing um, nine... I think it's, it's either seven or nine knots in a cord to basically seal a spell. I've also seen knot magic used to, you seal energy with each knot you tie. And then as you are manifesting, you untie the knots each day for like seven or nine successive days. It's pretty cool. Uh, poppets. Poppets are actually one of my very favorite things. Now, the voodoo doll as you know it, is fiction. Poppets are dolls, basically simulacra of a human figure, um, often, you know, created with the features of the target of the spell. Um, I have done poppet magic for myself to kind of help me to break harmful patterns or to forge more healthy habits. Um, I've also, I very commonly use, if I'm doing cord cutting um, between individuals, I'll make poppets of each individual, tie them together with a literal cord, and physically cut the cord. Um, but that can get, there's whole books about that kind of practice, um, and it's very tradition specific, but it's really huge amounts of potential and it can be very very simple i've seen poppet magic where you literally like go to the dollar store and buy like the off-brand barbie dolls 
for like two dollars and you use that as your pop it you could do all kinds of things um movement i have seen people do spells as sacred dances essentially um or and there's mudras in hindu tradition that are really amazing not my strong point so feel free to google it um uh tempest uh, laura tempest sarkov has some amazing things about magical movement so google her if you will um similarly sigils uh, laura is a expert in sigil magic um, you can create all kinds of beautiful symbols and sigils and intentional specific designs that you can do things like draw them on the bottom of your shoe so that every step empowers your intention. You can embroider them on a pouch that's then filled with magical objects to bring your intentions with you throughout your day. You can do all kinds of wonderful things. Um, but yeah, that's one of the resources, Sigil Witchery by Laura Tempest-Sarkoff. She's amazing. Read her all of her books. Um, I will always do a sigil in my morning oatmeal, and then I eat it. That's my bit of kitchen witchery I do every, almost every day. Um, prayers and petitions. If you're working with spirits or deities, you can pray or state a petition to those allies to help you out with your intention. Pretty simple. Uh, tarot magic. There are vast tomes on tarot magic, so I'm not going to go into it hugely here. But if you like tarot cards and the symbolism of the decks and that sort of thing, you can actually use them as symbols in magical workings, and you can do all kinds of wonderful things with them. It's not something that I tend to do a whole heck of a lot. I tend to just use it for divination. Um, but I know some folks that are very, very tarot focused that do some amazing spell work with them. I've seen whole rituals done by laying out cards in particular patterns and things. Really cool. Um, lastly is ritual magic. Now, ritual magic is one of those things where every tradition does rituals slightly differently. You're kind of standard neo-pagan ritual is going to be things like ground and center cast a sacred circle call forth the elements and the deities raise energy direct energy make an offering of thanks dismiss all of your allies dispel your sacred circle and then ground and center again there are books and books and books on ritual craft um and then there's ceremonial magic, there's chaos magic, there's all kinds of different practices that have different rituals. And it all really boils down to make your safe space, whatever that looks like. Raise your energy, send it forth, say thank you, clean up after yourself. Um, I tend to use ritual magic when I'm doing major workings. Um, or devotional workings, things where it's very, it's big, it's specific, I need extra safeguards. You know, it's not the, I'm running late, please help me to not ha run into a traffic jam. It's the, I'm going to change my life kind of stuff. Or, you know, if I'm doing a working for someone else, I tend to do it more ritualized. You know, if I'm healing someone who is in the hospital with uh, a disease, you know, that's going to be a major working that's going to require extra safeguards, extra guidelines. And I'll do that in ritual context. Uh, but like I said, I'll have this handout linked um, in the description down there so you can look at the different methods and get some more details on it. Um, must know spells. Any practitioner worth their salt should have at least one kind of in their back pocket spell for basic protection, Simple health, basic luck, basic prosperity, basic rituals, and usually some kind of basic travel protection because we all have to get from point A to point B somehow. And that can be dangerous. So I highly, highly recommend looking through that handout of all those different methods and then think about these major areas of spell work and what kind of things you might consider doing for them. You know, this is start your own grimoire or book of shadows, whatever that needs to look like for you. For me, it's a Google Drive. Um, 
you do not need to get very fancy with this stuff. I've seen people do them in index cards. I've seen people do them in spreadsheets. I've seen beautiful hand calligraphied vellum books that are bound in calf's leather. Do what you feel. Um, but get some basic spells as things that you might actually be willing to practice. Start actually trying some different spells. Small things. Small things. Because if you screw it up, your consequences will be equally small. Don't start with major life-changing work as a beginner. You will screw it up. You will have unintended consequences. You will not like. Don't call me to clean up after you if you tried to do too much too fast. Start small. Practice. Get good at the little things. Then try the bigger things. Aftercare. Turns out, magical energy is energy, and when you use a bunch of it, afterwards you get tired. Magical practice is, in fact, a practice. It's like any other skill. You have muscles. You have to develop them. Not just muscle memory, but the strength of these muscles. It is very, very common for beginners to have pretty intense magical hangovers. When you burn magical energy and you're not used to it, you'll get headaches, you'll get jittery, you'll get tired, um, you can get muscle aches, you can have all kinds of weird kind of just feeling off and unhappy. Um, if you're too imprudent, you can actually make yourself vulnerable to psychic attack if you're using too much energy and not taking care of yourself afterwards. So that brings us to... How do you take care of yourself? If you're going to do a spell, you're spending energy. So you must then replace the energy you spent. Same way if you're drawing energy out of a space, you've got to put energy back. If you're drawing energy out of yourself, you must put the energy back. Things like eating a nutritious snack. Um, <laughs> in my first group, we ate a lot of bread and cheese and fruit and nuts and that sort of thing. Um, these days I drink a lot of herbal teas after doing magical workings and I let the actual, um, herbal blends have their own natural properties and I let that kind of replenish, replenish me. Um, there's a lot of chamomile involved. Um, you know, like I said, eating fruit, there's a whole kind of thing about, you know, having cakes and ale in a lot of pagan traditions where it's after a ritual or part of your offerings is you have some type of food and some type of drink. It both replenishes yourself and kind of honors whatever allies have helped you out. Um, you know, maybe it's making sure that you have time to take a nap, you have time to take a bath, that you make sure you ground and center properly both before and after you've done your magic. So that, you know, sometimes when you do magic, you'll be really drained. And sometimes you'll do magic, you will have tapped into things, and you're going to be utterly jazzed like you've had four espressos. Um, everybody's a little bit different. Every working is a little bit different. Start small so that you're using a little less. You know, you don't start off running by doing a marathon. You start by running for three minutes. There's a reason for that. Magic is the same. It's a muscle. You have to strengthen it. Um... Be mindful of yourself. If you don't feel good, you need to take care of yourself. Whether that's eating or resting, you know, maybe it means that you, if you're going to do a spell, you know it takes you maybe an hour or two to kind of come back down to earth afterwards. Maybe you make sure your kids are out of the house so that you're going to have some quiet time to recuperate. Maybe it means that you're going to go out for a walk and commune with nature. You know, whatever thing you need to do to replenish your own energies, do it. So that is the basics of spell casting. There's a lot. There's a lot. I know this is the longest lesson so far. Um, but it is the heart of the matter. So what I recommend, your, your homework, should you choose to accept it, Think about where you're going to draw energy from as you do spell work. And then choose at least three different spell working methods and write three to five basic spells using different methods. 
you know, go for those core areas, basic health, basic sweetening, luck, basic prosperity, communication, simple things that are helpful, positive energies for anyone in any time. And then actually do some spells, do some actual spell work. The only way to know how it's going to feel is to actually do it. Um, hopefully you're going to start small, start small. Draw a small amount of energy, learn what it feels like to tune it, learn what it feels like to send it out, and then how you feel afterwards. So you can start trying out different ways of taking care of yourself, taking care of your environment to make sure that whatever you send out, you put back and that you get the results you want with the absolute minimum of unintended or negative consequences. Practice is the only way to get good at this. If all you do is read as an armchair occultist and you never do any of these things, then you're not a practitioner. It is that simple. To be a practitioner, you must practice. So go forth, do some magic, and in the next lesson, we're gonna talk about some more advanced ways of combining all of those components we've talked about to make more advanced major workings. Have a wonderful day. Bye.